Hi, I'm James Skidmore, and I'm a faculty member at the University of Waterloo, where I'm also a director of the Waterloo Centre for German Studies, a uh, privately endowed research institute at the university. My presentation is called Communicating the Humanizing Qualities of Online Education. And I'm presenting it because I've been reading with interest the reactions of higher education um, instructors and, and uh, professors uh, about the, this massive shift that we've seen to uh, online education during the pandemic. So I want to talk to you about that today. I want to talk about those, those ideas that have been coming forward. And then I want to um, critique them and provide some uh, counter arguments because uh, much of the, the, the press, if you will, about uh, online education has been kind of negative. And I want to look into that. Um, the presentation that you, you'll see today, it can be found at my website, jamesmskidmore.com slash presentations, where you'll have all the resources, etc. that I'm presenting. You'll have that there. And I'd also like to note that when I speak about online education, I'm speaking about everything involved in online. I'm thinking of distributed education and distance education and digital uh, pedagogy and all of that. I'm trying, I just use the term online education. I know some people prefer other terms, but that's what I like to use. So I'm going to highlight the main arguments I've been seeing, and then I'm going to explain how those arguments can be countered. And I, and I think we do need to counter them, and I'll provide some resources to help. So in, in the, uh, uh, the commentary that we've been seeing about uh, online education in the pandemic and, and, and the, the critique of it, it's, it's fallen into two basic categories, the dislike of online education and the distrust of online education. So let's look first at the dislike of online education. One example is a, an article by uh, Johann, uh, Johann uh, Mendick Miles that came out in University Affairs. It came out just a couple of weeks before lockdown occurred in, in Ontario at any rate. But it's, uh, it's, so it's prescient in that regard, but it's, it, it really sp uh, speaks to, the, to some of the issues. And I find it very interesting. You know, she argues that the classroom is, is, the, is the way to give full expression to what she calls the human vibe. And she tells the story of a prof who, who was just, you know, just a marvelous storyteller in class. And that through that um, educational experience, that's where she really learned something because of that, because of that charisma. It enabled then that this, this, this atmosphere that could generate the aha moments of education, which she thinks are vital to education and which can't be, can't be replicated in the online environment. It's, it's manu the, the manufactured simulations, as she calls them, and the pretend communities of the online platforms just don't cut it, in her view. Another example of a, of a, a similar argument uh, was uh, made by, um, um, it, by Johann Zimmerman. I'm just going to go down here to see his argument. And his argument in, in Video Kills the Radio Star, he talks about education... Um, as uh, he, 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 he's a, actually, he's an historian of, of, uh, television and the uses of television in education. So the, especially the uses of, of televising professors and televising instructors throughout the history of American education. And he's especially interested that the, that the use of television is an attempt to capture that charisma, that pro professorial or instructor charisma. And um, so think of, you know, the storytelling prof in, 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 um, in um, Medic Miles. And, but the recordings can't do that. It's, um, now I'm not sure what Zimmerman's talking about when he's talking about a conversation of a soul, but clearly he's trying to get at something that, you know, that education needs to foster deep, meaningful learning, but that that's only possible through instructor-learner interaction that's taking place in the same place, in the classroom, and not via any kind of mediated channel. Now, a third critique that came out in the, um, this came out in the New York Times, uh, this um, um, op-ed piece in which uh, Professor Strassler, an anthropology professor at, uh, in New York, um, she feels that the, 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 the Zoom classroom, as she calls it, will just uh, it's too invasive, first of all. She finds it an invasive technology because she can see into the student's 
lives into their rooms into their homes and uh, and and but but and, and she feels so strongly that bell hooks had it right that the classroom despite its limitations is the, that that location of possibility but that possibility um in the classroom is because the classroom is this neutral territory where you can build this new community and uh, that's better than the one on the outside but the zoom mediated classroom put that in scare quotes or at least i think strassler would um can't achieve that so a real dislike because it doesn't allow for that human um connection that could come with the classroom now the other um strand of the critique against uh, online education is the uh distrust of online education and this is probably most strongly felt in Honor Brabazon's uh, article that appeared in Academic Matters. That's the OCUFA, the Ontario Confederation of University Faculty Associations. That's their magazine. And she, uh, this article is quite long, and, and she sort of um, provides an overview of how the pandemic is allowing universities to further a neoliberal agenda that would... Um, where, where this ethos is dominating higher education and where training compliant drones trumps, and yes, that pun is intended, trumps educating an active and knowledgeable citizenry. So education in this view is merely content delivery. And online, uh, higher, uh, in, in this view, that's what higher education is. And then online education is then that ideal vehicle for that content delivery. And she's pushing back against that because she feels it's unable to give voice, online education is unable to give voice to the, to the uh, progressive transformative pedagogy, which she thinks is so important in her teaching and in, in university teaching generally. So she, she makes the argument that the, the, it's, the, it's the immersive classroom experience that... Uh, that education can, can give students an effective experience and that, that, then, that that's where education can reach its, its social or its, its humanizing potential. Now, Brabazon then uh, goes on to write, uh, to give a new definition, a definition that's different for a lot of people, I think, that active learning is, is a kind of, it has a meaning of, that it, it becomes a pedagogy of empathy, narrative, and shared experiences built on trust. And this trust can only be achieved in regular meetings in a classroom, in a physical space. So the video and audio components of online education uh, disrupt that. They're obstacles to the trust building exercise she thinks should be, uh, that she thinks is, is what education should be about. Uh, other critiques that have come along in this regard, uh, Richard Watermeyer and all, um, they did a, a, a survey of educators uh, in the UK and the US, mainly the UK, and there they found that, as one person put it, um, the university will use this as an opportunity, the pandemic, as an opportunity to remove all face-to-face -face teaching. In, in another article uh, in, that appeared in uh, Inside Higher Education by Steve Mentz and Christopher Schauberg, there, th there we see a, um, an uneasiness, an unease about the, uh, the corporate interests that are involved in higher, uh, in online education, sorry that the corporate interests and their agendas, they have an agenda for promoting distributed learning and that that agenda, of course, leaves them feeling very uneasy. So when we, when we summarize the arguments, you see here, I've summarized them on the left of this slide, and it really boils down to a simple and a simplistic notion that classroom education is more human than online education. I feel there are just too many holes in this argument. And I, and I think like educators like us, those who attend tests, for example, and know that, the, know that online education can indeed be very human, um, we need to counter such flimsy arguments because I don't think they do anyone a service. So for example, how well do classrooms connect learners when the learners don't show up? How magical can a prof's instruction be when a learner is too distracted or too 
uh, overwhelmed or too disinterested to, to succumb to that magic. You know, why do we think that education is just about the instructor-learner interaction? What about all the hard work that must go on in isolation or away from the classroom? The hours spent reading, studying, thinking, writing, problem solving. That's all a part of education. It's not just the classroom. The other thing that I think becomes clear is that the critics of online education have just not seen the innovative uh, practices that make online education so vibrant and useful. And I don't mean useful for some new nefarious liberal agenda, but in fostering intellectual growth, in providing students with knowledge and connectivity that the critics wish for. And I have to admit, I also get a little bit angry when I hear the argument that the pandemic, uh, during this pandemic, that online instruction is more human. I, we, sh we just shouldn't be offering in-class instruction at the moment. Ontario is seeing a surge in cases at the point in time when I'm uh, speaking to you or recording this at the end of September. You know, and without online education, our students would be getting no education at all. And I do not see the humanity in that. So how do we, how do we counter this? What, what can we use to counter this? I, I provide some examples of some practical considerations. So Robert Ubel's um, um, point that online education actually came to the rescue of conventional higher education. I agree, it did. Um, we, James Lang, who's the author of uh, Small Teaching, he, uh, he, provides, uh, he provides the argument or he, he makes the argument that, that you know, we have to avoid lazy generalizations. He's absolutely right. And he also makes the point that, you know, that the, we, we shouldn't be denigrating the, the work of these faculty members who are involved in online education because it, it, they're doing transformative work. But you'll notice he says he's, it won't satisfy many students. So he's still a little reluctant but he recognizes the transformational aspect. George um, uh, Velizianos, who's a, a well-known educator here in Canada, an educational theorist, he points out there's no, there's no reason to try to make these uh, arguments that the classroom is better than online or online is better than the classroom. And I provide there, uh, under the practical considerations column, uh, an article about the effectiveness of the two modes and how they're equal, roughly. Um, but he makes the point that good education isn't the result of proximity, but of practice. And so he creates these, uh, these seven elements of a good online course. And you might be quibble about this or that element, but what's really good about this uh, approach and what I think how we can make use of it is that it provides kind of a structure or a framework that shows the, the different things that, that, that we often claim for online education. And then our job is to provide good concrete examples for each of those. And so that we can counter those arguments by here's a framework, here's here's what we believe, and here's an example, a localized example from my university that shows you X, Y, or Z. And so I think that's a really good uh, way to do it. And plus, I love his point that, you know, these are the qualities of all courses, not just the online courses. I also provide you in my resources here, a couple of other frameworks, such as you know, some information on critical digital pedagogy and the ACE framework, to show you that 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 uh, online education can counter this neoliberal agenda. It's not a it's not necessarily a neoliberal approach to education. Let me conclude very briefly by just saying, you know, I I could have written here education not just online education. Education humanizes learning when you know, we focus on students' intellectual growth and we provide this open and communicative environment. You know, that's what we're trying to do. We're providing opportunities for students to grow intellectually and we're creating learning environments where they can do that, that are open and respectful. You know, we need to move beyond the zero-sum game that pits these two modes of, of education against each other uh, you know, it's all education and it's all good if it's a human space that puts the learners learning first. So thanks very much for listening to me. And if you have any questions or want to learn more, please get in touch with me. Happy to help any way I can. Thank you.